Uh, we'd like to thank all of these companies and, and people for their contributions to, to this virtual event and for being along with us for the transition and the difficulties that that has brought along. <clears throat> Uh, we have Warner Media at the diamond level. There are only diamond sponsors, so big thanks to them. Uh, Kennesaw State University, Coles College, and their Department of Information Systems at the gold level, along with Bishop Fox, Coal Fire, Genuine Parts Company, and NCR. Crystal level, we've got Critical Path and Synopsis. Silver level, we've got Aaron's Binary Defense, Black Hills, Core Light, and Guide Point Security. Uh, bronze level, NCC Group. And then our in-kind sponsors are EC Council for their online training and Secure Code Warrior for the virtual CTF. We'd also like to thank Crosshair Information Technology, Joe Gray, Offensive Security, and Pentester Labs for their contributions to the raffle prizes. Uh, and now I'm going to hand it off to Alyssa Miller and let her give her talk. There you go, Alyssa. Well, hello, B-Sides Atlanta. Hopefully with that, I've got your attention. Uh, so I'm Alyssa Miller, and I'm super excited to be here. Definitely, um, you know, with everything that's going on here, kind of uh, a, a weird environment to have to do these things online. But um, hey, we're going to make it work, and I'm really happy to be here. So let me tell you, first of all, just a little about me and let me get rid of this thing. I love the fact that Zoom loves to put that up there every chance it gets. So a little bit about me. Um, so first of all, for those of you that don't know me, I'm a hacker and a researcher. Um, I've been what I would call hacking since I was very early on in childhood, started with just technology toys, taking things apart and uh, figuring out how they all worked. When I turned 12, I actually bought my first computer, taught myself how to program in basic and did some hacking in some online services and some things, finding my way into and beyond paywalls, things of that nature. So nowadays um, I've been doing a lot of research into things around machine learning and, and deep fake videos. Um, but, uh, Beyond that, I'm also a security advocate, which is why I'm here talking to you today. As a security advocate, I do like to get out and talk with the community. I like to share my ideas, hear what other people's ideas are, maybe have them challenge my ideas, challenge my thoughts, just discuss this whole big thing that we call security, right? I, it's security is so pervasive in every part of our lives these days and being able to go out and to share that information and to just talk about it is something that I really enjoy. Now, recently I did also start uh, working for an organization called Sneak. And so within Sneak, my actual job title is application security advocate. So my role now within Sneak is to get out with the community, talk about what it is that we do in terms of application security, how as security practitioners, we can get better being a part of this culture we call DevSecOps and so forth. And then finally, um, I'm an author and a blogger. I am working on a book currently to help those that are trying to get into security careers to start to build their careers. I do blog fairly regularly, both for my employer and as well for um, my own personal uh, gratification, I guess, or just, again, another way to, to share that information so you can visit my website and, and view that blog as well. 
And then finally, I am a co-host on a podcast called The Uncommon Journey, where really our focus is just to share the stories, all those unique stories that people have for how they got into cybersecurity. And if you look around our community, you'll see there's so many unique, different stories for how people got here. And so we like to share those stories with the world. Speaking of stories, I want to share a story with you. So I'm here today to talk to you about threat modeling. And this story goes back a number of years when I was working as a consultant for an application security uh, consultancy company. And we were working with an organization that had established actually a really pretty impressive threat, threat modeling program. So they had made this program of theirs very efficient. They had streamlined and standardized the whole process for how they did it. And it consisted of some front work where the engineering teams and the project teams had to create some diagrams and answer some questionnaires. And then they got together in a meeting and in the course of about an hour or two, they walked through all the information about this application and that's how they built out their threat model. We came out of it with action items, specifications for certain security controls that would have to be implemented and so forth. It was a really impressive process. And all said and done, it took generally between eight to 16 hours to complete this process. So one to two days. Um, for those of you that have done threat modeling before, you know, doing threat modeling in one to two days is pretty impressive. But I remember going into one of these sessions as a consultant to assist them with this process. And after we got done with the conversation and we, we came out of that meeting, I was talking with one of the developers and he made the comment to me, you know, I, I can't wait until we're done doing this and we, we don't have to do these anymore. And I, I was kind of confused. What do you, what do you mean? Why, why wouldn't you have to do threat modeling? And the next word stuck with me and he said, well, we're moving to DevOps and you, you can't do threat modeling in DevOps. It, it takes too long. It, it doesn't work with, we're trying to implement this CI CD pipeline and we can't do that if we're doing DevOps or if we're doing threat modeling in the middle of that, that that's going to be inhibitive. And that got me thinking. And I started thinking about threat modeling. And I started thinking about how people look at threat modeling. So for those of you who have done threat modeling before, you may be familiar with this book, or if you've had any interest in threat modeling, you may be familiar with this book. You may have read this book. This is the book by Adam Shostak. This book came out years ago and it details, it is probably the gold standard for the process of conducting threat modeling within an organization. But it came out years ago. And while this book is worded and written to be very non-prescriptive, to be very flexible, to offer frameworks without being too granular, Unfortunately, it gets taken very verbatim. And there's a lot of processes, there's a lot of requirements, a lot of different steps to that threat modeling discipline that are presented in this book that people try to implement as part of their threat modeling as they should. But unfortunately, it leads people to view threat modeling as this very heavy weight, very time consuming, very difficult process. If we start to break it down, we can see why. So within this process, this is one of the things that they tell you you're supposed to create. This is a data flow diagram. And the approach to threat modeling is we've got this large application, this large monolithic thing that we're going to look at. Maybe it's even as simple as a microservice, but we still, we want to look at it, it holistically. We're going to talk about all the places that data flows in and out. We're gonna talk about those different trust boundaries. We're gonna talk about where data gets stored. We're gonna talk about how data gets processed at each step of its journey through the application. And this is where we begin. 
for a lot of organizations, just creating that is very time consuming, especially if you've never done a threat model for that application before. Now you have to create this entire diagram. Now imagine trying to do that when you're in a CICD environment and things are constantly changing. That becomes problematic. Then it moves on and we're supposed to create these attack tree drawings. So there's a lot of drawings and things being created as part of a traditional threat model approach and they become very time consuming. So this is now I've, I've laid it out and I kind of understand what my threats are and I'm gonna lay out how those threats travel through my system. But again, very time consuming if it's a large application in particular. One of the other issues that I see with the traditional threat modeling is this idea of stride. If you're involved in threat modeling, you've almost assuredly heard of stride before. Stride is nothing but a way to categorize the different threats. The problem I have with stride is that it's very technically focused. If you look at this, you see things like spoofing and tampering and repudiation, and information disclosure, denial of service, elevation of privilege. These are all things that at a functional level, when we're talking to the people who will use an application, the people who understand how it applies to the business, they don't necessarily understand what these terms even mean. So this can be really troublesome because it, it means that there's this high bar of technical aptitude that people conducting threat modeling within our organizations have to achieve. And then we move on. Then we have these things like dread and then dread wasn't enough. So we came up with dread plus D and, and dread is okay. Now that we know all of these threats, how are we going to categorize them in terms of their overall severity and so forth? And so there's all these frameworks. There's others you, you may have heard of pasta and people have taken a lot of different approaches to just how do we do threat modeling? Um, and you, you'll see them documented, you'll see different uh, diagrams that try to show what this process looks like. But that became so complex that we, we wanted to start looking at, well, how do we look at common attack vectors, a common threats? So then we, we created this thing called CAPEC, right? And CAPEC is a way to document threats that are common across multiple applications and so forth. But the taxonomy looks something like this diagram here. So we've added even more complexity on top of this. So it's no wonder then that developers who are entering a DevOps model look at this and say, there's no way that this fits. So around about 2008, DevOps became a thing, right? Patrick Dubois and another individual in Belgium got together and they said, hey, why can't we develop differently? Well, they were developers. And their focus was, how do we make development faster? How do we make it easier? How do we make it so that we can respond quickly to the needs of our users? Those are great things for developers to be thinking about. That's what we want out of an entire development organization we want our culture to be one where we're always trying to move quickly, create quickly, deploy quickly. That's what DevOps is about. It's about this culture. And it's about bringing together Dev and Ops together to be this shared responsibility for quickly delivering stable software. Now, when we talk about DevOps, Security got left out of that conversation. And security got left out of that conversation because everything that we gave to the development teams were hurdles. We put gates in the way. You had to pass this quality gate for security before you could move to production. You had to do these static code analysis. You had to do dynamic uh, application analysis. We had to go through pen tests. We had to do all of these things that stood in the way of you taking code from your development environment and getting it into production. We as security made it as hard as possible. As a result, we got left out of this conversation. So threat modeling was a part of that. Threat modeling was one of those things that although it, it wasn't well adopted universally, it was something that we kept telling developers they needed to do. 
But why? Why? What is threat modeling? Why do we do threat modeling? What is this big old thing? So as I started thinking about threat modeling and all the problems, I asked myself that question. How do I define threat modeling? How does the industry define threat modeling? Now, normally if we were in person, this is where I would ask you to, to tell me your ideas of how you would define threat modeling, but we're a little less interactive here today. But I'm gonna ask you to at least think about it in your head for a moment. If someone came to you and said, how would you define threat modeling? What would you tell them? So I did what we always do. We found Google and I went on, I started looking for some of these possible uh, definitions. And one of the first definitions I found here that you can see was from OWASP. And in that definition, they, you can see how complex this is. This is not an easy to follow definition. I'm not even gonna read it to you because it's so long and lengthy. But you can see it centers around very technical terms like denial of service, failure of a storage device. Um, we see all the, the classic vulnerabilities and threats and countermeasures and mitigations. And this is an unwieldy definition. So in addition to a complex process, now we can't even define this thing easily. But OWASP isn't alone. I went to Wikipedia. I mean, if it's on Wikipedia, it's true, right? And it was just as complex. And we're talking about things about attacker's profile and attack vectors and assets most desired by the attacker, answers questions like, where am I most vulnerable? Oh my gosh, this is such a lengthy definition. Who's gonna be able to read this and actually make use of this? So it's still complex. Well, okay, Microsoft wrote the book on it. What does Microsoft say? Well, Microsoft simplifies it a bit, right? They bring it down to it's an engineering technique you can use to help you identify threats, attacks, vulnerabilities, and countermeasures that could affect your applications. Um, this is still lengthy. And it's still not simple enough. Because when we go to developers and we're in a DevOps environment, we need to be able to explain it succinctly, quickly, help them understand why this is something that they want to do, why this is something that's going to enable them to be better in their development. So when I think about threat modeling, and I thought long and hard on this, like how am I going to really define this? I decided, let's just take it back to the, just the bare objective of why do I do threat modeling? When I think about threat modeling at its core, it is simply answering the question, what could possibly go wrong? I'm looking at my application and I wanna know from a security perspective, what could possibly go wrong? Where are those areas where it could be targeted for attack, where threats are most likely going to want to manipulate or to attack that application in some way. This is what I do threat modeling for. So finally, a succinct definition. The reason we threat model is to identify the likely threats to a system so that we can inform the design of security countermeasures. That's it. We're just trying to say, these are the threats. Therefore, this is how you need to design security countermeasures in the system. I searched long and hard for this definition. You know who authored this definition? I had to, because I couldn't find anything this simple, this straightforward. But the reality is, it is just that simple and that straightforward. So when I start to think about threat modeling in these terms, now I can start to explain to my developers, to my business owners, to my security leaders, we can do threat modeling 
in DevOps without breaking DevOps. Now, how are we going to do that? How are we going to use threat modeling now to start to create this thing that we've thrown the term out there, DevSecOps? We want security to be a part of this culture. And indeed, when we talk about DevOps, if I go back to 2008 and I look at where DevOps came from, DevOps was always meant to be a cultural change. And when we think cultural change, we think people, we think tools, processes, technology, governance, all of these come together to form a culture. Now, if you go out and you go to a conference that is centered around DevOps, you go and you talk to people who this is their primary focus. More often than not, the things you're gonna hear about are the tools, the technology, and the processes. There is very little focus paid to people. And indeed, I went out, I, I, I did some Google Analytics. I went out and I investigated in search terms that included DevSecOps, how many of them included the word tools versus how many included people. And the results are not totally surprising. There was about a 700% difference between tools and people in those search terms. So people think about tools, they think about automation, they think about the CI CD pipeline and, and how, do we, how do we make that flow faster and how do we automate different pieces of that within our builds, within our promotions, how do we make this all happen? People don't really think about the people component, that human factor that is so important when we talk about creating a culture. When we think DevOps, we think about this. We think about that CI CD pipeline. How am I going to make it faster? How am I going to make it stronger? It's in the term DevSecOps. We think developers, we think security, we think operations. And security, as I've covered ad nauseum already, tends to get forgotten about because we excluded ourselves from that conversation. So if I'm looking to figure out how I'm going to plug security into this, We've heard it preached a million times, push left, push left, push left. We've got developers pushing right, pushing right, pushing right. We're giving them more and more control. And we've created this thing, DevOps, that brings de developers and operations together. So we're continuing to push developers farther right. They've got things now, they're, they're implementing technology like containers and Kubernetes clusters and things of this nature where They've now got control of the entire infrastructure on which they're going to deploy their applications. They've pushed as far right as they can go practically. So we in security are still trying to push left. We're trying to create this culture of shared responsibility where everybody's responsible for developing secure software quickly and with stability. That's DevSecOps. So, for us to keep pushing left, we need to continue to keep everything that we do as frictionless as possible for the developers. So I started looking at threat modeling and how can we push it further left? Well, what's, what's the furthest left we can go? Well, the furthest left we can go, it's that user story, right? Development in DevSecOps starts with a user story. Until I take that story off the backlog and I start to develop it, the developer really isn't involved. They might have some role in developing certain user stories and writing these and whatnot, but why can't I, in this idea of continuous integration, continuous development, start to implement a model of continuous improvement? So instead of taking this gigantic monolithic approach to threat modeling and trying to threat model my entire application. What if I build threat modeling into each user story? And now with each tiny component that I'm going to develop, I have threat modeling information right there at the time I take it off the backlog. Now I sit down with it as a developer, I understand what the threats are. 
and I can develop my code even in a very fast paced DevOps CI CD environment, I can develop my code with the necessary controls in place because I understood the threats from the beginning, the minute that story came from the backlog. Now, remember I said people, I said focus on people, right? Who's creating these user stories? It's not typically developers. It is not typically the security people. It is not typically your operations people. It's the business people. It's the people who understand how the users are using that application day in and day out. It's the business people that understand how that application applies to the overall objectives of the organization. They're the ones that we want writing these threat models. But if we're going to use things like Stride and Pasta and Dread, and we're going to throw all this technical stuff at it, that's not going to work. So we need to simplify this. We need to look at what really matters. We're back to what's the worst thing that could happen. Hey, you want me to create this user story? Great. Tell me about that user story. What does that user story mean in terms of how we're going to be attacked? What is the worst thing that could happen by us adding this new piece of functionality, this new story to the user experience? What is the worst thing that could happen there? Tell me about that from a business perspective. Add that to my user story. Now, when I, as a developer, I take that off the backlog, I have the information. Not only does it inform my development in terms of creating the right security controls, it actually gives me greater context to understand what it is that I'm creating, how critical it is to the overall application. And all of this helps me develop better, quicker, faster. If I understand the threats and I understand the controls I need to implement, any of those automated security gates we have that occur downstream in the pipeline, I'm better and able to pass those more easily. So now I'm starting to create a more frictionless environment for my developers. And that's what's important when we want developers to adopt our security initiatives within their DevOps pipeline. So how do I simplify this for the business people? Well, I can tell you right now, we're not doing this anymore. Take these data flow diagrams, they go away. We are not looking at this as a monolithic application, we're simplifying this. We wanna understand things from the terms of business assets. What is it that makes a difference to the business? What is most meaningful from a business perspective? And that's gonna be things like private data. Certainly, if any of us have been watching the news, we understand the level to which private data is being exposed, being compromised, being sold on the market. But being able to deliver critical business functions, that's also a business asset. Just the availability of our application is meaningful in monetary terms, in objective terms, in tangible terms to the business. So we need to be able to identify that when we talk threats. We also have financial assets. These are pretty obvious. Uh, attackers are going to be out to steal money, steal things of value from us beyond just data. But what about our people? Aren't our people assets to the organization too? So isn't it important that we understand how a change, how a new user story, how that that new functionality within an application could also be leveraged to attack our people. And how do we design countermeasures then that are going to help us protect those people? And then finally, of course, we have secrets. We have secrets of all kinds. That's what business is all about. We have trade secrets. We have the secrets that exist within the application itself, right? We may have passwords, we may have keys, we may have other things. We need to understand how that user story creates or modifies our use of secrets. And then we can define and build the necessary controls to defend those secrets as we design our application. So now that I understand those threats in business terms, 
I can take this massive, heavily technical focused stride framework and I can throw that away too. We don't need to define things in terms of these technical attack vectors. Let's think about it differently. What are the actual threats? If I understand that those are my business assets, what are the threats to them? The first is probably the one most of us think about quickest these days, it's theft. They're going to try to steal something from our organization. They might also be attempting to commit fraud. So if I'm creating a user story that implements new functionality, that new functionality might be subject to fraudulent transactions. That's something I want the business people to pull out and warn me about, that this is a potential abuse case that an attacker might use. Of course, exposed data. In today's day and age of big data, massive stores of information, these huge data lakes that we're using and monetizing that data, We've seen the breaches out, talked about every day, practically, in the media. So we know exposed data is an issue. So we want the business people to point that out to us. Where is that data that these attackers may want to expose? And then, of course, interrupted business. There's too many attackers from nation state perspectives, especially if I'm in critical infrastructure, who want to do us harm just by making our system's unavailable. So if this new user story, this new component introduces a way that it, an attacker might want to come after our application to interrupt that functionality because it's a way that we're delivering a critical function, we want the business people to highlight these. And we want them to highlight these in the user story so that they're there early for the developers. So now we can turn to our developers and say, okay, it's your turn. You've got the information there in front of you. We've now set forth for you an understanding of the threats in common everyday terms. We're not talking about spoofing. We're not talking about denial of service. We're talking about things in everyday terms that any person can understand. So the information is available to you. You've been informed. Now it's up to you as a software developer to implement that within your code. So this idea of attack trees, same thing, it goes away. We're not gonna ask developers to sit here and map out an attack tree. This is time consuming and within the concept or the construct of a specific user story, it's not necessary. We've already illustrated what those threats look like and we've already given it to you in plain English. We don't need a complex attack tree. Instead, we need to think about security controls a little different. Let's, let's make this simpler. And I'm gonna tell you as a developer, I want you for each threat that I've identified to implement three types of controls. That's it. Three types of security controls for each threat that I identified for you. The first is a detection control. I want you as the developer to enable your code within that user story to detect the presence of that type of threat. This could be through logging. This could be through other means, but we want that ability to say, this threat is coming at us right now. Next thing we want is we want those mitigation controls. So I want a mitigation control. Now, what, what do I really mean? We hear the term mitigation a lot when we talk about risk management and so forth. But what do I mean when I say a mitigation control? What is the purpose of a mitigating control? Mitigation controls, like I show here using an example from Return of the Jedi, because everybody loves Star Wars, right? That shield they put around the Death Star, what was its purpose? Its purpose was not to completely stop and thwart an attack. It was to slow the attackers so that the defenders had time to detect and to respond 
to that incoming attack. So when I talk mitigation defenses within my applications, those controls that I'm talking about controls that just slow down an attack, things that are going to make it more difficult for that attacker to attack that application. Things that are going to make it so that I have time to react to that incoming attack. And then finally, I want them to think about a third set of controls. And these are those active defenses. So now I've slowed down that attack. I've forced them to, to hold up and to have to really devise ways around those mitigation controls. While they're doing that, I have the time to react and I want those controls in place where I can actively shut down that threat. Whether it's disabling a user account, whether it's some form of morphic technology within the application itself, how do I go about shutting down that attack? I need my developers to build those controls inherently into the application. So as I construct these now, what we start to do is a couple things. First of all, as I said before, we've enabled the developers now. We've given them this information on the front end. We've made it easier for them to design these security controls so that their code will pass those later stages that might hold up their build or might hold up their pull requests later on because of a security issue. They've been able to identify it early. A nice offshoot of this, because we've started to design security controls now with the assets in mind, is that we start to move away from this traditional approach of security design. If we look at security design since 1960, when we implemented our first password protected system, we've always looked at security from the outside in. As security practitioners, we talk about it, right? That crunchy outer exterior, and then that ooey gooey middle that's soft and easy to attack once people have broken that perimeter. Well, when I take threat modeling and I start to design my controls around those assets, I now start to do this inside out security design. I now have an asset centric security design where my strongest security controls start at the assets that matter most, the things I have to defend the most, and then they build out from there. That's how I want to design security, whether I'm talking about networks, whether I'm talking about applications, regardless of what the scope is, that's how I should be looking at my security controls. So this form of threat modeling enables that. It creates a completely new culture. And then finally, because it's made things so much easier for the developers, this is how I bring security into a DevSecOps pipeline. I've now created something that's frictionless. I've now created something that helps my developers. I've now created something that the developers eventually, as they start to see the benefits from this, will actually want to implement. They actually want to be a part of this because it makes their lives easier. Developers want to create secure code but they don't want people standing in their way and preventing them from being able to code quickly to create new, cool, exciting features and things that address the needs of their users. So this is how we can plug in as security practitioners. So before I wrap things up, I wanna leave you with this quote. And unfortunately, I haven't been able to find attribution for it, but we cannot change where we're headed by doing the same things that got us here. Since 1961, with that first password control, password protected system, we've been thinking about security as a bolt on. We've looked at security as this thing that we have to inject forcibly into development, into operations. DevSecOps has taught us we have to think about it differently. We have to build a culture where we, as security practitioners, except that we are responsible for code getting to production quickly. We are responsible for the stability of that code throughout. Yes, the developers, the operations folks, they are also, they share responsibility with us 
in terms of making sure that software is secure, making sure that infrastructure is secure. We're all in this together, but we have to change how we think about security, how we think about what we do in terms of threat modeling and other controls and make it something that enables our developers, something that creates, to borrow a term from Netflix, that paved road for how they get from development to production with the least amount of resistance possible. This approach to threat modeling is one of the key ways we can start to do that. So as I wrap things up, I wanna invite you to continue the conversation. Here's my contact info if you wanna grab a screenshot on your computer. Um, easiest way by far to get in touch with me is through Twitter. I'm constantly active out there. Professor Andy can tell you, he's, he sees my tweets all the time. Hopefully some of you are following me already. If I'm not following you, point it out to me and I will follow you. Uh, but Alyssa M underscore infosec is where you can find me. If you're looking more on a professional level to talk, not so much day to day, but let's talk careers, things of that nature, or more at that, that enterprise corporate level, reach out to me on LinkedIn. Uh, you can see it there, Alyssa M. Dash Infosec is my profile on LinkedIn. I'm always happy to connect to people, like to see what you're doing, like to see what your cool projects are. Uh, you can go out there, you'll see all me sharing my cool projects from time to time as well. And then finally, I mentioned before I have my website and my blog. Uh, you can go out there, alyssasec.com. Not only do I post my blog out there, this is also where I post my speaking engagements, of course, right now. Um, some of those are limited because a lot of them have gone virtual, but that's okay. I uh, still, as an advocate, I stay very active. I still want to interact with the community. And so I'm happy to do so through any of those means. And I really do invite you to get in touch with me and let me know what you think. Let me know what questions you have. I'm very happy to have these conversations with you moving forward. So with that, I wanna say thank you. Um, on behalf of myself, on behalf, behalf of B-Sides Atlanta, and also on behalf of my organization, Sneak, uh, always happy to have further conversation with you folks and to really talk about how do we make DevSecOps a reality for us. We've been dealing with this for better than 10 years. And security still is that forgotten element. So let's see what we can do to make it better. And with that, um, I think we have time and the facility for questions. So I will open up the floor if there's things either from the moderator or things that you guys have in Slack. I'm gonna take a look here. Let's see if I can get my controls back. So there's a question here, um, aren't those terms that I showed in the stride slide deck part of the common body of knowledge? Um, yes, when, as your, your follow up there, um, as we're speaking in CISSP terms, yeah, but that's exactly the problem. They're known to us in the security community. Outside of the security community, when I talk to developers, they don't necessarily know what those terms mean. And that's what I'm trying to change. Um, when I talk about those business people who now are the ones that are writing these uh, user stories, they definitely don't understand what all those terms mean. And trying to apply those very technically focused terms to the development process is what becomes very cumbersome. Now it's, I have to have a trained CISSP for instance, be a part of that threat modeling approach in order to make sense of it because I'm trying to apply stride and dread and so forth. And so, you know, in, in this case, yeah, it's common to us, but we need to start to have that empathy for the wider organization and understand that they don't understand those terms. And so by making it easier for them, especially if I'm going to ask them to bring threat modeling to the user story, I need to give them something simpler something that has business context and something that has more plain language application. 
Uh, let's see. So without the fancy tree killing deliverables, what are the effective deliverables for the one above that us trench workers can easily produce and deliver in this new model? So thinking in terms of metrics, right? Um, Cause that's ultimately what do we have the deliverables for there so that we have metrics. So your first deliverable is just being able to identify within the user story itself. When I say identify this in the user story, I'm literally talking about changing your templates. If it's in JIRA, go into JIRA and set up one to two to three questions that just address things like what are the critical assets that are a part of this user story? Um, what are the specific threats? And there is a training component to this, right? If you're gonna ask business people to do this, you do at least want them to understand what the expectations are. So that's your first deliverable is just having that information in that user story. Now on the flip side of that, um, most development organizations, even a DevSecOps model, there is some promotion documentation that's required, right? So developers in some way are documenting what they've done within a user story. So where I've seen that implemented is just, it's a quick couple statements. Here are the controls that I implemented in response to these particular threats that were identified in the user story. So it's kind of that, that post implementation piece. And so that's all you need from a deliverables, deliverables perspective, because now you can demonstrate the threats that you identified. You can identify the controls that you implemented. And as a result, you have measurable metrics that start to speak to what you're doing in terms of addressing security within that application. So now when you elevate that to security leaders, to business leaders, they can see that and they can see the tangible results that that is having within the security of that application. Okay, um, I don't know, are there any other questions? I see a couple people typing, so I'm gonna wait for just a moment. What do you think about the step of moving a user story? So in code review, the code reviewers can assert that on the face that the developer did X, Y, Z. Yes, exactly. So um, kind of to the, the point that I was just making in terms of deliverables and so forth, um, you want the user story to be something that continues throughout. If we look at the way user stories are used today, not only do they inform the development, but they also inform the testing, right? We were gonna write use cases and indeed long-term, some of those use cases will become regression test use cases, but things that are informing our test cycles on the back end. So where I've got threat information in there, those are now test cases that I can write that become a part of my test set as well. So taking that user story then and populating it throughout the pipeline, um, becomes crucial to this. And where I've seen organizations that have gotten really good at this, what they're able to do is just like they've done with other test cases where they've automated user story formation into a, uh, a test case within their test suite, you can do the same thing with the threat information. Start to look at how do we define um, those test cases that are going to test for the exposures of that data via the, the threats that we identified. And so that can be very powerful as well. Okay. Well, thank you, Kevin. That's uh, very awesome to hear that. And yeah, that's uh, bringing it to those layman's terms. Um, is crucial. Uh, it's how we enable, I, I've, in certain conversations when I've talked about extending this idea of DevSecOps culture to the business side, I've actually, I've used the term and then cringed. I've said biz DevSecOps. I don't want to get into that motion of constantly adding new three letter terms to that already lengthy term. Um, but it is, it's important, right? To, to have this culture where everybody in the organization has that sense of some shared responsibility and bringing threat modeling into plain language that's in the user story is a great way to tie in the, the business side and to really get them to experience their, their capability to affect the overall security posture of the applications.
All right. Well, I, I think we're good. I think that's all the questions we have. So I will, I will stop the, the conversation here, but I will stay in the Slack for a while to uh, interact with you folks more if you have further questions. Again, want to thank everybody so much. Uh, I definitely appreciate your attention, appreciate you being here, uh, appreciate B-Sides for the opportunity to be a part of it. And yeah, <laughs> and Mike has come up with biz dev compliance, sec legal consultant, ops hipster. Perfect. I, I think we're going with that. I'm, I'm going to hold on to that one. Awesome. Well, take care, everybody. I hope you have a wonderful rest of the conference.